need you with my life. I said I need you, Jesus. I really need you with my life. You know I need you, Jesus. I really need you with my life. I said I need you, Jesus. I really need you with my life. I'm tired of going through the same thing, running in and out. What's going on, Shelly? What's going on? Hey, what's up? Good to see you, Caitlin. Bass playing extraordinaire. I used to play bass. Hey, Shelba, what's going on? Hey, everybody. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> Teresa, welcome. Can you hear me okay? You're not a pro. Amen. Yeah, trying out a new mic. Someone, Lisa Moon, had sent me some uh, stuff from Amazon on the wish list, and I have a new lapel mic. I was trying it out with my phone. I got some other goodies, too, some guitar strings and so forth. Anyway, we're going to go out tonight. Hey, Mama Mia, Miss Stokely. Lighting and stoking the fire is a revival. Hello, Mr. Doctor. No one's in the house. Amen. No internet? Dude, there's no internet in hell, so I know what you're feeling like. <laughs> yeah, I'm I've been real I've been really busy. I've been um uh, I've been just doing stuff. I've been doing the podcast. Um we've been going out a lot. Did you guys see the um the video? We went, you know how people say, well, why don't they go to the hospital and pray for people and get people healed, yeah? So we did that, man. Uh, I don't know if you guys have caught that video, but uh, we were praying in the park <clears throat> on Sunday. And, uh, you know, in Acts 13, where you wait on the Lord, we're like, you know, let's go to the VA hospital, man. And I, if you see in the video... Susan and I were sitting there, we're just like so excited because we knew God was going to move. And uh, man, I just knew it. I just knew God was going to move. And the day before, we were doing something on Saturday. Dude, I don't even remember. It's all kind of just rolling together. I don't even remember. We're doing a lot of ministry out, out in the streets of Memphis. Oh yeah, yeah, we were out in the streets of Memphis. Yeah, we went to uh, Merge Memphis. For those of you that are in the Memphis area... Merge Memphis rocks. Um, Sherry Seagraves McClure, she started this ministry like a year or two ago. Somebody donated her a food truck. It's all God, man. And she just meets the homeless and feeds them. And uh, yeah, and then they they sell the food too. Uh, I, I don't. I haven't been to the food truck. I've only done the other stuff. But they sell the they sell the food. Fifty percent of it goes to give away the food. So I think their slogan is Feed Memphis so we can feed Memphis, that type of thing. Anyway, so we were doing that. And, dude, I don't even remember. We've just been real busy. But one of the things I want to talk about to you guys about today, talking about Jesus, is <clears throat> what is it that inspires a Christian to get off the couch and do something? All right. Shelly needs a room. I will pray for you. Yeah, well, it's his love. Okay. Now, Shelly, what, what does it mean to encounter his love? It's awareness of our identity. Um, from a selfish standpoint, I don't know if it's, it's like me, 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 but who our identity is in Christ. We're hidden in Christ. And who are we? The thing is, when, when God's love overtakes you, when you are consumed by the love of God, not textual, right, God is love, right? Yeah, that's somewhere in the Johns. When we're consumed by the love of God, there's something that happens that motivates us to do stuff for God. It, it, uh, the, the love and encounter of God fuels us to go out and actually do stuff. Like, let, let's say, for instance, I'm always talking about Acts chapter 9. Uh, we're driven. We are compelled. The love of Christ compels us. It's kind of like we start seeing things from His perspective. When we're in Christ, you know, we're seeing things from 
his perspective. So we see that people are actually in a burning building. Amen. We actually see that even though they don't. And we want to rescue them. And once they become encountered with the love of Christ, they go, oh, they, they get on fire. I'm just going to say that the love of Christ is not something that you can reason. It's not something that you can carnally deduce. And one of the things is that the carnal mind is at enmity with God. It's at enmity with the things of God because God's a spirit. So spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Amen? So we must be in the spirit. God's a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen? So when we, when we study the text and we're so enraptured in the text... Um, I want you to think of this, okay? I'm always saying in Acts, there was a church, and the book was written about them, it was called Acts. If there was a book written about today's church, it would be called Talks, right? So let's think about this for a second. You know, we know that God breathed through holy men as the scriptures were written. Now, that was a spiritual thing. When God spoke through Jeremiah, when God spoke through... Um, all the prophets, Ezekiel, all of them. He, they didn't have the revelation. Chronologically, they went from not having the revelation to have inspiration, which means to be in the Spirit of God. Then God, knew, breathing through their identity, breathing through their culture, they knew the Hebrew words, they knew the Hebrew letters, somehow he orchestrated every letter to come out perfectly. Because... If looking back now, if we look at Daniel 12, 4, but thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even till the time of the end when many shall run to and fro, knowledge shall be increased. We looked at this word seal in Daniel 12, 4 means that to encode. Basically, it means to, to encode. And then at the latter days, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but I, uh, Isaac Newton, he wrote a, a, uh, a commentary on the book of Daniel, you know, because he knew that there was going to be. Uh, some codes in the Bible. So he started looking for them. And now we look back and we see things like equidistant letter sequences and how marvelous every, every letter in the Bible is. Every Hebrew letter is not just an alphabetic letter. It's also a number, but it's also a symbol. So everything that God does is freaking miraculous. I mean, it's awesome, right? So he breathed through these people. Chronologically, they didn't know anything. Then they get a revelation. Uh-oh, I've got a revelation. Let me go grab my pen. Okay? Then God breathes through them, through their culture, and, and uh, they start writing this text, which is so perfect that each letter, each jot and tittle, each yod, which is the Hebrew little, is not out of place. Amen? Looking back, we can see that um, we can see how marvelous that is. But now... Here's what happens. These spiritual people translated this spiritual idea, this spiritual revelation of God, they put it onto some text, and then they hand it to non-spiritual people. This is the sad thing about winds of doctrine going through the church. The pastor may be truly inspired. He may truly be onto something. God may have breathed this through him, but I heard it through the grapevine comes in, and the congregation <clears throat> only hears what they want to hear. They want to hear that, oh, I can turn grace into lasciviousness. They want to hear that I can blab it and grab it and get anything I want. You know, not carry your cross and follow me, deny yourself, not, not all that stuff, okay? But the Spirit goes through the person, then this text is out there. So we, we have the early disciples, they have all this God-inspired text that they're looking at. They're looking at all this God-inspired text. They know miracles happened, like the parting of the Red Sea. They know this carnally, and they believe it. But, you know, how much do they believe? Do they rely upon it, or do they just speculate? Do they just kind of, you know, kind of believe, like it may be true? <clears throat> so they've got this text. Then they get an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Now, this Holy Spirit that was touching them, they didn't have the New Testament canon, guys. They didn't have Corinthians. They didn't have Galatians. They didn't have greater is it he that is in me than he that is in the world. They didn't have all that. They had this text in the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, I want you to think for a second. Could you today win somebody to the Lord with the Old Testament text? Think about it. Right? Now, 
looking back, we can see in hindsight that there were some prophecies fulfilled. We can even see that carnally. But there's something about the Spirit of God, something about the Spirit of God that once you encounter God, He turns your light on and you're excited. So these people that encountered the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit fell on some of them. They started speaking in tongues. They weren't even circumcised. They're like, oh my gosh, who, who, who can forbid water for these guys to be baptized? They're doing miracles and stuff. They did the miracles, but not by the reading of the law, not by the works of the law, but by the hearing of faith, the hearing of the preaching. Then they received the Spirit. So, think about it again. There's, there's an importance that we need to ascribe to our spiritual relationship. The text is paramount. The Spirit and the Word agree. But we're sitting here like, you know what? I need to get really involved in the text. And this is the text that we're putting so much emphasis on that they didn't even have yet. And they were doing miracles. Amen? So think about the importance of the Spirit. They didn't even have the New Testament text. They were raising people from the dead, healing the sick, casting out demons, and it was so awesome to be a Christian that people wanted to be Christians even though they would be fed to the lions or crucified. Nero was burning Christians at the stake just because his garden was dark at night and they would light up the roads. I mean, would you become a Christian only through intellectual ascent? No, you'd have to do it with the power of God. So the text was God-breathed, and then later on, Paul, the Apostle Paul, was the top theologian. He was sitting at the feet of Gamaliel. Amen? Sitting at the feet of Gamaliel, the top theologian of the day. He had his theology down so pat that he was killing Christians with his theology because he was up here. Right? He was thinking. He was thinking. That's what he was doing. Then he has an encounter with Jesus. And then he talks about following the Spirit. Bam! Fire! Amen? So think today about the importance of the spiritual aspect of our relationship. And let's ask ourselves today, if we're not motivated, then why is that? If they were motivated to become Christians on pain of death of being fed to lions, then what's our excuse? Cook your noodle, huh? Amen? So think about that. We need the Spirit and the Word. Now, first off, you know, a lot of people think that the Bible is the Word. Well, Jesus is the Word. In the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. In John 1.14, says the Word became flesh. Jesus is the Word. So, no, I'm not discounting the Bible at all, because the Spirit and the Word agree. We know that from the Revelator in John. But think about how they didn't have that text. They were operating a lot off the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine? Could you? Let me ask you this question. Could you just make somebody be a Christian with only the Old Testament? That's what they were doing. <laughs> That's what people were becoming Christians before the canon, the New Testament canon, came into existence. You know, the, dude, the, the, tr the doctrine of the Trinity wasn't even solidified for like 300 years, you know. It started coming into existence in 100 A.D. or so, and then around the Council of Nicaea, I think it was a struggle then, that was 325 A.D. So, you know, there were all these things that the disciples, our early disciples, didn't have. Amen? Anyway, so think about that. Think about our relationship with the Spirit of God what motivates us to move? Now, notice that Paul was filled with the Spirit. Only after he's filled with the Spirit could he do miracles. He could not. He knew the same text, right? He knew the text before he was Spirit-filled. But he wasn't working miracles with it. Amen? All right, Father God, we just pray for Shelly right now, Lord. We pray for direction to come in her life, Lord. Isaiah 53 is a suffering servant passage. We see that in hindsight. It's a very prophetic passage. Lord, we thank you for lighting up her path. Lord, we thank you for being a shield about her, Father God, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for 
nothing shall by any means harm her. Lord, I thank you that you quell, you quell the, the storm that's going around. We uh, tell the voices of the enemy to shut up in the name of Jesus. We thank you that she has the helmet of salvation. We thank you for favor wherever she goes. We thank you for places to live. Your word says, Matthew 6, around there, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his way of doing things right. These things will be added unto you, Lord. That's what you said. We claim that for her. In Jesus' name. God bless you guys. Anyway, if this has touched you, please uh, consider sharing this with your friends. I didn't know I was going to be talking about that. In Jesus' name. God bless you guys. Oh, yeah, we're going out tonight. We're going out tonight on uh, to help with the, uh, the homeless. And we're going to pray for people at the bus station. Listen, I'm going to need your guys' kind of like advice and stuff because I'm trying to get uh, stuff cheap. Hey, Tracy. I'm trying to get stuff cheap, like uh, the toothbrushes. And uh, Krista said, was it Krista? Yeah, she said I could get dentist office to donate the toothbrush, the dollar store. Yeah, we're going to, I would just, I just came from the dollar store, but I kind of, I also went to Walgreens and Walmart. What I was kind of needed today, today only, is uh, wool caps and the gloves. So when we go down Bill Street, you know, the cold people, uh, we try to give them something, you know, something to the showing up empty handed. Um, we give them stuff like gum, a uh, little bit of food, uh, gospel tracts. Sometimes we have Bibles, but the homeless people, they don't really carry around Bibles. We use that for people at the bus station that are sitting and waiting. Um, we use the gallon plastic bags, and we just put all sorts of stuff in there. Hand warmers, Kleenex, and when it gets warm, we're going to need bug spray. Uh, someone said, if you ask a homeless person what they want when it starts getting warm, When it starts getting warm, they need bug spray. Amen? So if you guys can think about how we can get that cheap, too. All right? God bless you guys. Thank you for being in my life. Until we meet again, dig deeper and go higher.